If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Christian Answers would like to announce a conference called Former Catholics for Christ Conference in Springfield, Illinois. The conference will cover in defense of sola scriptura, scripture alone, sola fide, faith alone, sola Christo, Christ alone, and sola gratia, grace alone. Four guest speakers, Robert M. Zins, director of A Christian Witness to Roman Catholicism, author conference speaker and apologist. Mike Gendron, director of Proclaiming the Gospel, author, conference speaker, evangelist, and apologist. Tim Kaufman, author, conference speaker, and apologist. Cecil Andrews, director of Take Heed Ministries from Northern Ireland, conference speaker, and apologist. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 1, and I'm going to read just three verses and try to put them together for you as an introduction to the grace of God in salvation. In contrast, this morning, the grace of God as understood by the Roman Catholic religion and the grace of God as presented in the scriptures for us. So if you're in Ephesians chapter 1, I'll be reading out of the NIV the New King James, and the New American Standard Bible. And there's a reason for that. It's because some translations seem to have a way of presenting the thought a little bit more clearly, and other translations are a little bit more faithful to the Greek text. So uh, at times I'll have to switch back and forth uh, depending upon if I feel at the moment they are more faithful to uh, the original languages. And I like what the NIV has done this morning with uh, Ephesians 2 and Colossians 1. I like what the New American Standard has done with Ephesians 1, 4 through 8. So let's read together Ephesians 1, 4 through 8. In love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace. You might want to underline that in your mind. To the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. Now, If you'll keep your thumb in Ephesians chapter 2 and turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, these verses are going to be put together this morning. I want to read verses 3 through 6 with you. Colossians chapter 1, verse 3, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. The faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you already have in the word of truth, the gospel, and that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. 
That's important for us this morning. We want to understand God's grace in all its truth. Now back to Ephesians chapter 2, and this will be the tie it together passage. You're all familiar with Ephesians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul writes, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved. Through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Well, what does the Apostle Paul mean when he says, it is by grace you have been saved, he says it twice in verse 5 and then again in verse 8. It is by grace you have been saved. What does the Apostle Paul mean when he says in Ephesians 1 verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace? What does he mean in verse 7 when he says according to the riches of his grace? And finally, what does he mean in Colossians chapter 1 when he says, I want you to understand God's grace in all of its truth. As Christians, this is a big deal to us, isn't it? If we miss God's grace and don't understand the grace of God in what the Apostle Paul says, all of its truth, then we've missed the gospel. And this morning, I want to present to you, first, the grace of God in Roman Catholic salvation. I want you to understand why we're here at this conference. I want you to understand so you can better tell others friends and relatives, maybe you have brothers or sisters who are still involved in the Roman Catholic religion, mothers and fathers, uncles and aunts, friends, workplace companions. I want you to understand how they understand the grace of God, and then I want you to understand how the Bible presents the grace of God. The two are incompatible, I assure you. You'll see that as we unfold. The sixth section of the Council of Trent meeting on January 13th in 1547 clarifies the Roman Catholic understanding of the grace of God in salvation. With these prefatory remarks, and I quote from the Council of Trent, this council intends for the praise and glory of Almighty God, for the tranquility of the church and the salvation of souls, to expound to all the faithful of Christ the true and salutary doctrine of justification, which the Son of Justice, Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, taught, which the apostles transmitted, and which the Catholic Church, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, has always retained. We strictly forbid that anyone henceforth presume to believe, preach, or teach Otherwise, then is defined and declared in this present decree. Pretty strong words, pretty straightforward. The Roman Catholic religion has an understanding of the grace of God, and if you don't like it and you begin to teach it, then you are anathema in Rome. Rome begins her understanding of the grace of God and salvation by making a strong case for the need of grace. You would be wrong if you thought that Roman Catholic religion doesn't think there's a need for grace. They do. They make a strong case for the need of grace in virtue of the fall of Adam and man's fall in Adam. Rome states clearly that all men have lost innocence and because of the deception of Adam have become unclean and by nature children of wrath and servants of sin. 
Rome teaches that neither Gentiles by force of nature or Jews by obeying the letter of the law of Moses are able to be liberated or to rise from their condition due to Adam's sin. But Rome is quick to add that man's free will was only weakened in its powers and downward bent and by no means extinguished in man. This determination that the will of man is only weakened and downward bent will be the strict guiding principle in Rome for everything Rome believes about grace and salvation. I'm going to repeat that for you because I want you to hang on to that. Rome is quick to add that man's free will was only weakened in its powers and downward bent, but by no means extinguished in man. The will of man is only weakened and downward bent, and as a result, this will be the guiding principle for everything Rome believes about grace and salvation. That's their defining principle. It begins right there with Adam. Rome believes that Adam's sin brought wrath and indignation. Adam's sin changed him for the worse. Adam's sin brought spiritual death. Adam's sin placed him under the power of Satan. Adam's sin lost justice and holiness for his posterity. Adam's sin transfused death, the pains of the body, and sin to the entire human race. Rome says All of mankind is born with original sin. What is contracted by generation must be washed away by regeneration. Unless one is regenerated, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Sounds like a pretty healthy evangelical sermon, doesn't it? This is Rome. I'm quoting directly from their highest sources. This is what they believe. I want you to hold on to this. This is Roman Catholic orthodoxy. The sin of Adam cannot be taken away either by forces of human nature or by a remedy other than the merit of the one mediator, Jesus Christ. You would be wrong if you thought that Rome didn't believe that Jesus Christ was the one mediator. You would be right if you said that you can go through Mary because she will appeal better to the one mediator for you. Okay? That's how Rome works. The merit of Jesus Christ is applied both to adults and to infants by the sacrament of baptism rightly administered in the form of the church. I want to quote from the highest source of Roman Catholic religion, the Council of Trent. If anyone denies that by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is conferred in baptism, The guilt of original sin is remitted or says that the whole of that which belongs to the essence of sin is not taken away in baptism, let him go to hell. Rome believes in baptismal regeneration. Rome believes that the damage done by Adam in original sin and passed on to his posterity is undone in the waters of baptism. That's where Rome believes a person is regenerated. And they also believe it's the beginning of their justification. Rome believes in incremental justification, that it starts, it stops, it halts, it begins again, it goes backwards, it can be gained, it can be lost. But it starts in the waters of baptism. For infants, when it comes to the eradication of Adam's sin, there is no ability to accept or reject the grace of God in baptism. The faith of the church stands in the place of the baby's cooperation with the grace of God. The Roman Catholic priest stands in the place of the baby and says yes to the grace of God, which remits Adam's sin and guilt at that moment. In this sense, grace is conditional, dependent upon those who avail themselves of the sacrament. You're going to begin to grow a picture in your mind of how Rome handles the grace of God as we move forward. Quote from the New Catholic Catechism, the church and the parents who would deny a child the priceless grace of becoming a child of God were they not to confer baptism shortly after birth. 
Rome believes that the priceless grace of God is given to a child at the point of baptism shortly after birth. That's one way of gaining the grace of God. For adults, Rome believes that God sends out what they call predisposing grace that moves individuals toward making a choice to be born again. That, quote, that they who by sin had been cut off from God may be disposed through the quickening and helping grace to convert themselves to their own justification by freely assenting to and cooperating with that grace so that while God touches the heart of a man through the illumination of the Holy Ghost, man himself does not do absolutely nothing. He is not passive. While receiving this inspiration, man can either accept or reject it. So what I'm saying here is that in Rome, if you need the grace of God, which you do, because all human beings are descended from Adam and carry with that descendancy, original sin. To get rid of that original sin, you need grace. The grace of getting rid of that original sin in infants is given in baptism. Infant is passive. The priest stands in the place of the infant and says yes to the grace of God for the infant. When it comes to the adult, <clears throat> Rome believes that the Holy Spirit is sent out and the Holy Spirit comes upon people and begins to try to convert them to the reality of their own sinfulness, the reality of the fact that they are guilty in Adam, the reality of their original sin. And the Holy Spirit begins to prod and to poke and to move about and so forth and so on. And uh, at some point, the person believes that he's being moved by the Holy Spirit. Now that person at that time can say yes to the Holy Spirit, or he can say no to the Holy Spirit. He can say yes to the grace of God. He can say no to the grace of God. If that person says yes to the grace of God after being wooed or moved or coming to some kinds of convictions of his own unworthiness before God, if he says yes to that, that's called the cooperation of prevenient grace and predisposing grace in the Roman Catholic religion. That person then needs the full grace of God. And he is directed to the waters of baptism. It will be in the waters of baptism where the grace of God will fully come into the heart, the soul, the mind of the candidate for baptism in the Roman Catholic religion. While God touches this heart of man through some illumination of the Holy Ghost, man can either accept or reject it. If he accepts it, then he is predisposed. When once saying yes to this grace, a person soon understands that he or she is a sinner, learns to detest his or her sin, befriends God, begins to repent of sin, and then seeks baptism for the washing away of sins and the start of a new life. Make no mistake about it, the Roman Catholic religion believes 100% in baptismal regeneration. That's where you get your forgiveness of sins, whether you're an infant or an adult. That's where you get the grace of God. That's where justification begins. That's where regeneration happens for you. Listen to these words. If anyone says that baptism is optional, that it is not necessary for salvation, let them go to hell. The instrumental cause of justification is the sacrament of baptism. The fruit of baptism, or baptismal grace, is a rich reality that includes forgiveness of original sin and all other personal sins, birth into the new life by which a man becomes an adoptive son of the Father, a member of Christ, and a temple of the Holy Spirit. By this very fact, the person baptized is incorporated into the church, the body of Christ, and made a share in the priesthood of Christ. You can't say it any better than that. Baptism is how one gets the glorious grace of God, and it is sin-forgiving grace in baptism. Now, Rome is committed to several theological positions which serve as a bedrock foundation 
to her entire understanding of grace. The will of man was only damaged by the fall of Satan. It's free to accept or reject this grace of God. Hence, according to Rome, prevenient grace is given to all of mankind and the ones who accept it and begin their path toward receiving full forgiveness in the waters of baptism are the ones who continue to say yes to God. Quote from Canon 4, Session 6, the Council of Trent. If anyone shall say that man's free will, moved and aroused by God, does not cooperate by assenting to God, who rouses and calls, whereby it disposes and prepares itself to obtain the grace of justification, and that man's will cannot dissent if it wishes, but that like something inanimate, it does nothing at all, let him go to hell. Literally, these words are powerful from the Council of Trent. They are saying that the final say for getting the grace of God lies with the will of man. That's what they're saying. And if the will of man cooperates and obeys the prompting of the Holy Spirit and finds his way or her way to the waters of baptism, then God will give the full grace in baptism. And that person at that point is born again, born from above, becomes a Christian, incorporated into the body of Christ, so forth and so on. The grace of God in Rome initiates a possible road to salvation. It's predisposing grace, but it can be rejected by man. Ongoing grace of God after baptism is through visible physical sacraments. You're not finished with the grace of God in baptism. You need more of it and more of it and more of it, and you gain it through other sacraments other than the initial one, which is baptism. The ongoing grace of God is infused through Rome sacraments to qualify those born from above in baptism, having had Adam's sin eradicated. And this word qualify is big in Roman Catholic theology. They believe that God qualifies people to gain entry into heaven by filling them with grace called sacramental grace through their sacramental system. That's why when I was a little boy, I was baptized right away by my parents, I think eight days after I was born. That's why I attended the Roman Catholic Catechism, Roman Catholic Church, and there came a point when I was old enough to be confirmed in the Roman Catholic religion. I was old enough to receive the Holy Spirit by the bishop. And then after a while, I gained grace through the sacrament of the Mass. Going to Mass is a grace-gaining event and sin-forgiving event in the Roman Catholic religion. All of this is centered upon their understanding of the grace of God. Roman Catholic theologians like to quote Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, where they say this. The Apostle Paul writes, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. They capitalize that word qualified. You're qualified by gaining the grace of God through the sacramental system so that you can possibly gain heaven at the end of your life. Rejection of the means of getting the grace of God results in a forfeiture of justification and salvation. No one can be certain that they are going to heaven since no one can be certain that they have confessed all their sins and will continue to receive the necessary grace of God to take them to heaven. In the case of all those baptized, whether adult or children, Rome believes there remains something inside of them that must be dealt with through additional sacraments. What remains in them is the inclination to sin, which in Roman terminology is called concupiscence, or the inclination towards sinning. And I want to quote here a Roman Catholic theologian who says, they who resist manfully the inclination to sin by the grace of Jesus Christ shall be crowned. Now when Rome says by the grace of Jesus Christ, Rome means by the grace given by Christ in the sacraments of the Roman Catholic religion. When they say we are saved by grace through faith, they mean by grace in the sacramental system, starting with baptism. You have to understand that Roman Catholics are very aggressive when it comes to evangelizing their religion. I've talked with many Roman Catholics over the years who say, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. 
And I go, this ought to be good. We get to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, and they say we are saved by grace through faith. Now let's talk about grace. And here it comes. The grace of God prevenient, which can be accepted or rejected. The grace of God in baptism. The grace of God in the Mass. The grace of God in the Sacrament of Confirmation. The grace of God. The grace of God. They like to talk about the grace of God, but this is their understanding of the grace of God. Essentially, Rome's view of the grace of God is, I'm going to throw out a theological term for you that you probably heard of. I'll try to explain it a little bit. The, Rome's view of the grace of God is semi-Pelagian. By this we mean man must cooperate with it in order for it to be effective. Man has his role. Man does his share. It's called semi-Pelagian because of the theologian that debated Augustine over the grace of God in the fourth century who claimed that man didn't need any grace at all. He could do it all by himself. He didn't need grace of God in baptism. He didn't need prevenient grace. He didn't need cooperating grace. He didn't need any kind of grace. He, on his own, could be good enough to come to God and God would accept him for his good works and his merit. Pelagian was called out by Augustine and eventually declared a heretic, and Pelagianism was refuted by every early church council. But the problem is, semi-Pelagian, man does half of it. Man does his share. If man doesn't cooperate, there is no grace. If man doesn't cooperate, there is no salvation. If man doesn't cooperate, there just simply is no regeneration. If man doesn't cooperate, there is no justification. Man does his share. That's called semi-Pelagian. Roman Catholicism is a semi-Pelagian religion based upon their understanding of the grace of God. And it is safe to say that if we view the grace of God as it pertains to salvation as a mere prevenient, cooperative, suggestive, instructional, helping, supportive grace then ultimately the final determination is always with man. Always with man. In this sense, saving grace is dependent upon man to accept or reject it. If a man refuses the helping graces of God, no matter what shape or form they take, God cannot save a man if man refuses. In the words of one theologian, this colossal, gigantic tribute to the free will of man as Lord and Master over the universe, having ultimate power to either accept or reject God, makes God merely a servant or a friend who advises and urges him to act whereas man himself determines whether or not he will allow himself to be persuaded. Roman Catholic is a man-centered religion based upon man's cooperative efforts with the grace of God. That's why it's a cradle-to-grade religion. Every Roman Catholic that I've talked to in my life has told me they're doing the best they can. And they believe that. They believe that by cooperating and doing the best they can, God is obligated as their friend to realize their best efforts are sufficient. Dr. R.C. Sproul, in his position paper entitled The Pelagian Captivity of the Church, puts it this way with reference to Rome. And I imagine all the first wave reformers would say a hearty amen to Dr. Sproul. Dr. Sproul says, while this is Rome's view, while we are so fallen that we can't be saved without grace, we are not so fallen that we don't have the ability to accept or reject the grace of God when it's offered to us. The will is weakened, but it's not enslaved. There remains in the core of our being an island of righteousness. That little parcel of goodness that is still intact in the soul or in the will that is the determinative difference between heaven and hell. In other words, salvation is of the man 
at the end of the day. God can't save you if you don't let him. That's Rome. Rome is a sophisticated religious system, but at the heart of it, it's an understanding that God's grace is offered and it's available through a maze of sacraments and religious observances. These are said to be left for us by Jesus Christ so that we may take advantage of the graces offered through obedience to these various religious grace-begetting obligations. All must be born of the Spirit, says Rome. The Holy Spirit moves, arouses, and inspires the will of man, whereby the will of man disposes and prepares himself to obtain the grace of God for justification. There is no such thing as efficacious grace in Roman Catholic understanding of grace. Justifying grace is received in the waters of Roman Catholic baptism, but can be lost, gained, improved, or weakened. Rome says in this way, man is born of the water and the spirit, the water being baptism. Justification is preserved and increased in man through good works done, stimulated by the grace of God given through the sacraments of the Roman Catholic religion. Or in the words of the Council of Trent, quote, good works are the good merits of the man justified and truly merit an increase of grace and glory. Canon 32 on justification. Are you getting the idea? Are you getting the picture of how Rome views grace? I hope you are. Now along comes the Protestant Reformation that exploded on the scene in the 16th and 17th century. What did our forefathers have to say about all of this? They were in the middle of it. They were in the thick of it. The reformers of the great Protestant Reformation viewed scripture altogether differently. Totally differently. While agreeing that the will of man was affected by the fall of Adam, the reformers viewed the effects of the fall as much more than damaged and bent down. Based upon the writings of the Apostle Paul and a number of the church fathers, the will of man was determined to be in bondage to a corrupt nature, leaving man spiritually dead. Man is not born merely unjust. Man is born impotent to see the kingdom of God, let alone choose for it. This is why a man must be born again. Literally, a man must be born from above by the Spirit of God in order to arise from his fallen state. Citing passages of Scripture like 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet himself is appraised by no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he should instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The early reformer said a natural man cannot help himself to the grace of God. He is unable. He is incapable. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 you were dead in your trespasses and sins and force in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Your will's in bondage to the corruptness of your deadness. Paul writes, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. The reformer said the Holy Spirit does not excite a bent down will to move itself to cooperate with the grace of God. The Spirit of God rather effectually regenerates the will whereby spiritual life is imparted. To be born of the Spirit is to have the will free, to see the necessity of believing for salvation. Man is so dead in bondage to a corrupt nature that he cannot help the helper. He cannot help the helper. He's dead. He's in bondage. The will is gone. There is no cooperation. There is no contribution of man. It is all of God to make alive those who are dead in their trespasses and sin. 
Based upon several New Testament passages, the early reformers were convinced that salvation was first and foremost an act of God through the Holy Spirit of supreme grace and that spiritually dead are unable to believe and be saved. First and foremost, an act of God whereby spiritually dead are unable to believe and to be saved. The reformers constantly quoted John 3, 8, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone born of the Spirit. They quoted James chapter 1, every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of life, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. And in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we might be, as it were, the first fruits among his creatures. The reformers sifted through the New Testament. Blessed be the Father and God of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1.23, For you have been born again, not of the seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is through the living and abiding Word of God, Acts 10, 44. When Peter was still speaking these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who were listening to the message. And all the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon these Gentiles. John six thirty seven. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. Six forty four. No one can come to me, you know unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on that last day. 665, and he was saying, for this reason I said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him by the Father. There began to emerge in the reformer's mind, the early first wave reformers, an idea of grace that was completely contrary to the Roman Catholic. They saw in scripture it wasn't cooperative grace. It wasn't a bent down will, it was a dead will. It was operative grace. It was efficacious grace. It was regenerative grace. It was the grace of God wherein he, in his sovereign will, according to the dictates of his eternal purposes in Christ, gives man life. And when he gives man life, man comes forth to believe. The hymn we sang earlier by John, uh, Charles Wesley, Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I arose, went forth, and followed thee. Thy, my chains fell off. That's how the early reformers viewed the grace of God. Ephesians 2, 3, 8. But God, being rich in his mercy, because of his great love, which he loved us, when we were dead in our transgressions, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. The picture of grace began to crystallize in the minds of the great reformers. Colossians 2, 13 and 14. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. God makes people alive from the dead. Listen to Rome. All must be born of the Spirit. By this is meant that the Holy Spirit attempts to woo the will of man, to agree that he needs to dispose and prepare himself to obtain the grace of justification in the waters of baptism. A man can say, yea or nay, it's up to man. Here's Rome again. There's no such thing as efficacious or irresistible grace in the Roman Catholic understanding of grace. Justifying grace is received in the waters of Roman Catholic baptism. In this way, a man is born of the water and the spirit. Justification is preserved and increased or lost, depending upon man. Man, through good works done, stimulated by the grace of God, begun in sacramental baptism and continued in Roman Catholic sacramental system, may even make it to heaven one day. Good works are the good merits of the man justified, and they truly merit an increase of grace. Now listen to the reformers. The Holy Spirit effectively, without failure, frees the will of man not to cooperate with grace and predispose him to prepare himself to receive grace in sacraments, 
but rather to believe the gospel of salvation. This gospel is a free gift of grace in Christ our Lord, gained by faith alone, not by sacraments. The work of the Holy Spirit is mysterious and miraculous and entirely irresistible and efficacious. At the point of regeneration, the will is set free to claim salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. There is no regeneration or beginning of incremental justification in the waters of baptism. It doesn't exist. John 3 does not use the term baptism, and certainly Christian baptism is not in view by John in John chapter 3. Justification is grounded only in the righteousness of Christ, given as a free grace gift. It cannot be lost and it cannot be improved. Good works are the fruit of regeneration and not the cause of the increase of grace. Rather, they are the natural result of the grace of Christ given as a free gift. Do you see the difference? These two systems could never come together, ever. They're radically opposed to each other. They cannot exist in the same room together. Somebody's right and somebody's wrong. Either reformers had it all right or Rome's got it all right. There is no equivocation on this. We read in Acts chapter 14, verse 3, So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there, speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. Well, I ask you, when God confirms the message of his grace, what does he have in mind? What is he confirming? What is the message of his grace? Is it baptismal regeneration in the waters of baptism followed by a series of sacramental religious rituals whereby you gain more grace, that whereby you can gain and lose salvation and justification? We are born again by water. Is that the grace of God that this band of early Christians was preaching throughout the land? Is that what Paul and Barnabas were comfortable with? And did God confirm the message of his grace? Is that his grace? The reformers said, no, that is not his grace. Not then and not now. You got it wrong. Your mad main religion is designed to put man at the center right from the get-go. The reformers to a man were willing to die for the grace of God. It is by grace, the secret act of God, in which he imparts new spiritual life to his own, that the gospel is believed. John Calvin, Martin Luther. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. On arriving, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. They couldn't even believe it were not for the grace of God. It's not cooperative, it's operative. Acts 20, 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. The Apostle Paul. But the free gift is not like the transgression, for if the transgression by the one, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to many. Romans 5. Romans 11. So too at the present time there's a remnant chosen by grace, and if by grace, then it is no longer by works or cooperation of man or the will of man or the contribution of man or the good thought of man or the good luck of man 
or the pluck of man or the courage of man or anything to do with man. If by grace, then it is no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. And I submit to you that the Roman Catholic understanding of grace is not the grace of God. And I stand on Romans chapter 11, verse 6. It's no longer grace. You can see that the reformers had a big task ahead of them because all of Europe was awash in the Roman Catholic sacramental system and their understanding of what happened when Adam sinned, the ensuing bent down will, the ensuing cooperative grace that they must agree to, the predisposition to save themselves in the waters of baptism. How do you fight that? When Martin Luther began tearing the whole system apart, one piece by one piece by one, he worked backwards. He said, if I'm saved by grace through faith alone, in Christ alone, I don't need this, I don't need this, I don't need this, I don't need this. And there came a time where he was blowing up the whole thing. He just worked backwards to blow up the whole thing. And ultimately, those uh, supporters of Luther were concerned for him. And one of them came up to him and they said, Martin, Martin, if you take away all of this from the people, what are you going to give them? And he said, I'll give them Christ. If you like our YouTube channel, please subscribe by clicking on the subscribe button and then by also clicking the bell above to get an automatic update whenever we produce another YouTube video for our See Answers TV channel. Please share our videos with your friends and relatives. May God bless you. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ will last. See related videos by tapping or clicking screens.